This is an episode of Reasonably Sound Classic. For the first 30-some episodes, this podcast was distributed by Infinite Guest, American Public Media's podcast network. Thus, it benefited from blanket broadcast licenses held with every music publisher. After going independent, pretty much all intro, outro, and interstitial music had to be removed. The intro and outro music you're going to hear is an in-progress version of Reasonably Sound's theme, written by Will Stratton. The awkward silences are where act break music used to be, so if you could just imagine like Queen or The Misfits or Kate Bush along the way, that would be great. If you want to support Reasonably Sound in the hopes that maybe one day I'll be able to afford some blanket licenses of my own, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. Okay, on with the show. The space where sound and war meet is a crowded one. Crowded in a way that maybe shouldn't be surprising. A quickly developing theme here on this newly minted podcast is how the ephemeral, barely physical, sometimes downright mystical qualities of sound have awarded it a certain reputation. This is the case in combat as it is elsewhere. Countries, armies, generals, researchers, private firms, they've all tried to harness sound, use it to stop whatever they might deem hostile, dead in its tracks. Or less than dead, but still stopped. They want to use sound to create deserters, surrenderers, traitors. The techniques for using sound to accomplish these goals have been many. And as time passes, we see more and more widely used acoustic combat technology and tactics. The beginnings, though, of sound in war were simple, even maybe somewhat elegant, if a little ineffective. And important, I think, to contextualize the way we talk and think about and use sound in combat and combat-like situations today. Owing, however, to the exceptionally broad range of the topic, I've invited my friend Dylan Thuris here to help me kind of wander through this massive topic, at least as a start, maybe plant the seeds for something we can come back to later. But before we get going, I'm going to let Dylan talk a little bit about who he is. Hello, I'm Dylan Therris. Uh I co-founded and run a website called Atlas Obscura about the world's hidden wonders. Uh, and I am interested in all the, the many ways in which the world is surprising and strange and delightful. Uh, so when I when I posted about Reasonably Sound on Facebook, you said your your reaction was... I think within the first couple minutes, you were like, please do an episode about sound and war. Yes. So what is, what is, is there, is that a particular thing that interests you or like, have, is this a thing that you've thought a lot about? Um, yes. Uh, in, in so far as, um, well, there, there's the, the way in which I think about it as a huge nerd, which is like always the, the idea of sound weapons the idea of this sort of ephemeral thing becoming physical what at what point does sound become i mean it's always a force in the world but but at what point does a sound become a real kinetic uh force right but there is there's this there there is this idea of it being this invisible sort of um like distributed thing but to have it actually create create a uh, physical change in something makes it more real in a way that is that is surprising and sort of weird and and maybe a little a little fun to to theorize about. Right. That, yeah. Okay. And I've long I, I've long been obsessed with um, these objects called sound mirrors um, built during World War One, which they built about fifteen of them, uh, and they're essentially giant architectural ears built to hear incoming airplanes and they're still there because they're massive and they're built out of concrete and it's just not worth taking them down but you know they're they're this confluence of uh warfare 
architecture and acoustics and hearing in, in this way that I find really, really interesting. You know, it's a 200 foot long parabolic ear. Yeah. Can you tell us, can you like just talk for a second about sort of what, like what they are and, and like where, where in the world are they? Uh, almost all of them uh, are in England. Okay. Uh, along the, along the coasts. Uh, one is in Malta and they were built uh, in this very weird time you know, at the start of World War One, there was a lot of, of development happening. And among that was was uh, war by air was, you know, the the, the threat of um, being basically bombed to smithereens. And people right. people didn't know how serious this was going to be. There was actually a lot of talk that like there could be casualties, you know, in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands, which it, it ended up being true, actually, yeah. you know, by, by World War Two. But people were sort of unclear of what this meant for civilization. And there was a lot of fear. And there was also, you know, not, none of the modern technology we think of as being associated with war. So radar didn't exist yet. Right, right. There was there was suddenly a whole new avenue for the enemy to get to you that and that it was the sea no longer mattered and terrain no longer mattered. And you, unless you got out your binoculars, there were no no quick ways to make to see what was incoming. And the binoculars were no good because by the time you saw the plane, it was already too late. You were it was way too late. Yeah, good point. Um, and there was this there is this phrase: the bombers will always get through. Whoa! Which basically meant um, the bombers were faster than the planes they could muster to stop the bombers. And essentially, by the time you knew the bombers were there, it was too late. You were screwed. So the one tool we had the one advanced warning system we had was sound so but this turned out I mean, part of the problem with binoculars too is you have to know where to look like with binoculars you have to know what you where you should be looking and, and the sky is a big place and a plane's coming uh sound however you know you don't need to know you can hear it um without knowing necessarily exactly where it is right so the idea is you have to extend the power of your hearing mm -hmm. and the way they did this was by building 30 foot tall giant concrete ears giant parabola you know parabolas so do they actually look so they're they're sort of like half satellite dish this is what i'm imagining it's like a half satellite dish made out of concrete just like stuck in the dirt yes it's a little bit like that I mean, imagine a giant um cube it's okay. usually got a sloped back actually so okay. a cube with a, a like 45 degree angle back and then on the front of the cube is just a, a scoop, an ice cream scoop out of the center of it. Okay. So just this huge concrete parabola. And, and then so that's sort of like the outer ear, right? And yep. then they they would set up a microphone in front of that, and they could actually position that microphone, and the way they positioned it would actually sort of turn the area of the sky that they could kind of be focusing right. on and listening that to. makes sense. Um, so they would gather all this sound, reflect it into this microphone, and then they would... Um, they would listen to, to, to get an advance warning. And it only gave them like six minutes. It was not particularly an enormous amount of time, but it was enough to potentially offset a little bit of some of the damage that could right. be done. At least that was the hope. That yeah. was the idea behind these. I wonder if there's, do you know, do you know if there was any consideration on the other side, on the, uh, the offensive side of the amount of noise made by the engines on the planes? Because I know there was a point at which, I think it might have been the Americans, but I'm not sure, uh, started putting sirens on the front of the plane that were that were very, very loud on purpose to just strike fear into the hearts of the people that they were about to, you know, attempt to annihilate. Yeah. So so the only th the only um, references that I've heard is that the Germans changed the oscillation of their engines. They, they set them. They used to like run sort of at the same oscillation and then they, they, they offset them. OK. So as to basically just create more noise to signal. So it was a little bit harder to figure out where this sound was coming from right it's yeah. not like a like a tone or something that's in in uh like consonants it's just more like a general right right so that's the only so yes obviously i think consideration was given huh. uh, on the other side that's however however the the sound mirrors provided such sort of little advance warning i don't actually think they were considered like a particularly great like they're defense. not they were like, not a success really. no 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 and some people were sort of like whatever yeah that's really cool. I mean, and these things, I feel like this is a side of the intersection of of sound and combat that 
you don't normally think about that. I think when when people normally think about audio being used in these sort of hostile situations, you don't normally think about infrastructure that is essentially put in place to provide defense. That, I think, is, is, a, is a whole side of this that doesn't normally get discussed. And normally when people think about sound and combat, it's very much this, this idea of you using audio to create a physical response in a hostile person. Yeah, so I, I, love, I love the sound mirrors also be, because they, um, they represent taking one of our senses and making it architectural. Any of the ways in which we expand our senses are kind of interesting to me. Um, in the same way that, you know, giant telescopes are massive eyes and work in very much the same way. And that they're, they're sort of these huge physical externalized version of our, you know, internal sensory organs is like very... I find it right. really intriguing yeah. and, and kind of um, like a, like a planetarium is this, I think a or a um, uh, observatory rather uh, is right. It's a similar thing, but like it, it it's this very particular shape that I think always always echoed to me the the sort of the um, the angle of of an eyeball that sort of rounded. Oh, that's thing. cool. I never thought about yeah. that. It's yeah, that always was interesting. And then and then you know it brought up some questions. I was looking into this and kind of one can sound be deadly if it was loud enough would it could it could it does it does it kill you does it damage yeah, your absolutely there's so there's um there's been there and this has been for so long there have been since actually probably about world war two no world war one since actually i think about world war one there has been non-stop like weird both like research with a capital r research with a lowercase r, research in quotes, research in like really big like hand quotes, and then just straight up conspiracy level, al almost alchemy style, trying to harness the power of sound to do bodily harm to people. And the difficulty in doing that is in order to do it, you need so much power and you need so much equipment that it becomes impractical. But it is absolutely possible. If you think about an explosion, just a like a huge, a massive explosion causes a shockwave. And if the shockwave is of a certain amplitude, if it, if it reaches, I think it's 210 decibels, it, it will tear your lungs and you will die of internal hemorrhaging. Um, but that's because, right, that's almost a s secondary effect, I guess, which is that, you know, the change in pressure has just basically affected your body. But but that is, that's just an order of, that's still on the scale of sound. I mean, yeah. it, it's just an, a much order higher. And it's, and that's, and like, that is, that is a thing that is produced by, uh, like, a, it has, it has a cause, right? That is an effect of something. And a lot of the research that has occurred for the last, you know, like 70 years or so has been, you know, how, like, how can we do that kind of thing without having to produce an explosion? Um, because sound has a, a pretty big, pretty big role in what is called, uh, n I think it's called no touch interrogation, which I think most of us would just describe as torture. Because people want, pe people, I, I use people very, um, very vaguely, would like to be able to extract information from enemy combatants in a way that is effective, yet done, done in such a way that is um, considered classically not harmful. So I think that that means no actual, not, no wounds, but that, but that they are psychologically and emotionally uh, and, and maybe physically, but not to the point of, of actual visible damage, exhausted and affected. And so that's, 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 I think, when people talk about using sound to hurt people, um, they're talking about that kind of thing. They're not talking about it as a secondary effect of... Right, not, they're, they're not talking about it as a kinetic force, they're talking about it as a kind of psychological force. Yeah. The, the playing of heavy metal outside of, you know... A compound or yeah like they did um, with um the branch davidians and with um, manuel noriega
I remember I, I read um, a very brief reference uh, to a project in the 70s called Project Disperse, and I'd love to find out more about this, where the government looked into finding universally reviled sounds, and they couldn't find any. It turns out that, except for the closest thing they found was just a pure tone. Yeah. That, uh, you know, a really Like in the middle loud. of your hearing range, just terrible, yeah. But but that otherwise it's too too culturally specific. Yeah. Um, which is weird because then it, it, yeah, I mean, the psychological effects are also coupled with a kind of cultural warfare. So why heavy metal into that? You know what I mean? It, it, we cho- You choose the music, the sounds are chosen because they are not just loud and aggressive, but also culturally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, foreign i was um i was reading a thing i don't know i don't know the accuracy of this but um i was reading a um a a piece about the kinds of music that are used in no touch interrogation situations that is such a terrible it's just sound it's such a euphemism for 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 just being psychological warfare yeah uh that they they figured out they tried a whole bunch of things and they would put on something like michael jackson just repeated the same thing over and over and over again very loudly, and it had very little effect. But they found that when they put on Metallica or ACDC, they figured out that those kinds of things, the aggressive-sounding things, were much more effective at reducing the mental state of the prisoners or the people being interrogated, not because the sounds themselves were more severe or harder to listen to but because the prisoners identified them as being satanic that they actually what they assumed to be the content of what they were listening to was more offensive than the actual sound so it's it really there really is this 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 cultural warfare that that comes into play it, th- so this makes me think these two we're talking about two different ways that sound is used as a weapon and it makes me think of two different examples in the way in which sound is used in what you might call sort of commercial warfare or sort of mild uh, in the commercial world warfare is probably a little strong there's there's the one sense there's have you heard of something called the mosquito um i have uh refresh my memory i'm blanking on it 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 is in i think it's a uk thing i don't know if it's in the u.s but it's installed at like supermarkets and like corner yes. shops yes, yes, and yes. it puts out a very high tone. There's one at the IKEA in Red Hook. Is there really? Yes, it drives me crazy. You you can hear it. Yes. I don't I think I probably can't it's, hear it. It's it's off. I would not hang out near it. Right. So the idea is this is a use of sound as pure tone. It is it is devoid of content. And the point is is that in theory only people under 25 can hear this. They have another version that everyone can hear. But basically it makes a very annoying constant sound. Yeah. And the idea is to discourage uh loitering, unwanted hanging out. Yeah. So that's one way in which like a commercial enterprise uses uses sound and sort of pure sound. I was um I was reading a um uh this book called Extremely Loud which is about the use of sound as a as a weapon and the author whose name I'm currently blanking on described it as um it's like you know it, like hooded um hoodie wearing teenagers hanging out in front of the entrance of a shop you know like loitering sort of combats the um the comfort of capitalism that like you know people will see these teenagers and because we as a culture identify teenagers especially teenagers wearing hoodies as being up to no good uh they will not enter the store and so these kids being kids have disrupted the comfort of capitalism and that the mosquito is a way to to just make them it choose them away right and so the other side of this the other thing that i guess would be there to reinforce the comfort of capitalism is something like elevator music or store soundtracks, which admittedly have gotten slightly more like raucous and 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 you know, but th- it's music specifically designed and chosen to be safe, accessible, to put you in a certain mindset. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of the soundtrack that happens in retail locations and especially restaurants is specifically chosen to make you shop and eat faster. Right. No loitering, whether you're a customer or not. Oh yeah. Please. Yeah.
Well, I, I want to go back one second to talk just briefly about the other um, way sound played a really large role in World War One. Yeah. There were all these, so that, you know, it was a trench war, but there were all of these tunnelers, sappers, whose job was basically to tunnel, to make inroads, you know, in these kinds of entrenched warfare right. situations. So there's, right, the layout was that there was, it was no man's land was sort of the battle, like the, the sort of actual battle zone right. where mortars were sent and where, you know, sometimes men would come out of the trench and cross. But on the opposite ends of no man's land were the trenches dug for the opposing forces. And so there's a network of tunnels going between right, like, so, the barracks and the supply place and the front line. And Well, and there were these sort of subterranean, um, uh, this kind of constant subterranean warfare happening. So people would start digging tunnels from their trench towards the enemy's trench. Oh. And what would happen is the hope was that you'd get a tunnel all the way to the enemy's trench. You'd pile in a ton of explosives and, and you'd blow them up. And it worked a number of times, actually. There were some massive you know, casualties caused in, in this way. Um, but, of course, both sides were doing it. And the way it worked is you would have someone, people would be digging, but they would be using, um, they would muffle their instruments. They would muffle their shoes. So uh, what we're talking about, like, uh, or like we have a spade with a towel wrapped around it, is that exactly? Okay, this is exactly what we're talking about, and uh, you know, as best you can when you're like breaking up rocks and stuff. But and then you'd have a guy on each side whose job he used a geophone. Uh, it was like a stethoscope, basically. <laughs> I was actually about to ask, like um, a stethoscope, exactly, uh, and would just listen for other tunnelers, and these guys would dig closer and closer to each other, listening. And hoping to either avoid detection or get close enough to be the first person to time their explosion right. So the idea was you dug a tunnel five feet from the other guy's tunnel. And when things got, when you should be really nervous is when you stopped hearing noise. Because that was when people were stacking explosives. It's sort of like, um, I mean, not, not to trivialize this, but it's kind of like chicken. Like it's almost a game of tunnel chicken. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. And and it was all sort of this strategic, you know, what angle you're building your tunnel at. This is also happening in the Alps, where the two sides were basically on the side of a mountain from each other, and they couldn't really fight each other effectively. So they would, you know, one guy would dig a tunnel, uh, you know, the Italian side would dig a tunnel, and the Austrian side would dig a tunnel underneath it and try and come up below. But at all the while sort of listening carefully to the mountain itself to hear what you could, to hear whether you could hear your enemies. And then people talked about, you know, you could hear guys talking. You could hear sort right. of these muffled voices. People were getting that close to each other. And there would be these awkward moments where people would bust through their tunnel into the other side's tunnel, and then there'd be sort of like, you know, co combat uh, in these in these underground um, uh, underground spaces. So It's like instantaneously useful intel. Right, like it's you're you're essentially gathering intelligence about what's happening five feet away from where you are, and so that you can then immediately deploy it. And I think right, like sound has this long, you know, like every spy movie ever has the scene where like there's a bug or someone's wearing a wire or you know that like gathering audio information is both I think physically and technologically easier than gathering visual information but that this is this is like a very sort of immediate and almost visceral use of you know you are you are you are literally listening to your environment like you are not you are not an agent in the environment listening you are you are identifying aspects of the environment like the ground and you are listening to it in the hopes that it will communicate a thing to you that will save lives right. and or, the, or I guess end other lives. Right. Right. And the, and the louder, the things you hear, the more danger you're in, you're sort of right there. It's, and, it has, a, it has sort of has its own um, like progress bar to danger. Right. Until it's silent. And then you're in the and, most danger. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting. Um, yeah. So let's uh, talk. I want to talk about the LRAD. Yes. And I want to talk about the LRAD in, in relationship to the mosquito. Because I think there's, so, um, uh, Co Code 9, do you know the musician Code 9? No. Uh, he's, he makes dance music, and he wrote a book, I'm blanking on his actual name, um, 
still getting over this cold, so my 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 recollection of specifics is still suffering a little bit. Uh, but he he wrote a book called Sonic Warfare, and he called uh, like a collection of technologies used as dispersal mechanisms. So like sonic dispersal, as uh, he referred to them, I think as as being from the military entertainment complex. And I think that that's especially interesting because all of those things kind of exist in two worlds, where they exist in this world of sound reproduction for addressing people directly. You know, like the LRAD is, I guess less so the Mosquito, but the LRAD is not classified as a weapon. So the, the, the you know, long-range acoustic device is a gigantic, I think, hexagonal deal that you attach to the top of a Humvee to the side of your ship and it has all of these transducers in it. I think it has a couple hundred, maybe maybe a few hundred transducers and it has a bunch of buttons on the back and it produces a warning signal. I think there's like a warning signal button. But then there is a basically a public address input and in that you can plug a microphone or I don't I don't know. I I don't know for sure whether or not there's an iPod in, but I would imagine there must be. And so that is what allows it to, to not be considered as weapon, that it can actually be used as a, like a hailing device or as a public address system, but that when you, you flip this switch, it becomes another thing entirely, right? It sort of, it sort of straddles this line between address slash entertainment you know like like what is the difference between that and the incredibly loud speaker array that you have at the club and so i think you know like seeing seeing the lrad deployed in in ferguson as a way to discourage the organization of people is just so i don't know it's just it's a very powerful powerful kind of reminder of what entertainment technology does or what what you can view as entertainment technology can do. Yeah, I I there must be some clubs or raves that have at least entertained the idea of buying an LRAD. Um, I don't know if it, you could what it would sound like actually to play anything over no, yeah. it. But right, the flip side is the metaphor for the state is like is so obvious. It's like I mean, it's a bullhorn taken to the nets. We have a louder voice. Yeah, the authority of our voice is simply going to be louder than yours like, like we can like you will be you will be silenced just b- as an effect of the fact of how loud we are right the state you have a thousand people and we have one guy and he is a because he is a function of the state his voice will be louder than yours right and it's sort of like it it, it is um yeah it's just kind of like obvious and direct a metaphor for the power of the state to 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 speak over people as yeah. you can have yeah I mean, the LRAD is such a right now piece of technology. It feels like it exists so solidly in this this moment. Yeah, and and right, this set of technology that blurs the line between warfare and crowd control. That like blurs the line between you know non lethal force meant to be utilized against protesting. I mean, against groups of people. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, um, you well, can't, can you actually be hurt by the LRAD? I mean, you it's not, it, it can't cause physical uh, damage, can it? I think that if you are close enough to it, mm-hmm. I believe that it is able to produce, uh, a, it's, it's warning tone. I think if you are, if you are close enough to it and it's cranked up to full, it can definitely cause temporary deafness. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it can cause permanent deafness, but it, it is, it is mostly considered a, yeah, like a dispersal device, that it is um, it is a thing that is very uncomfortable to be around. And it is also a device that is controlling, like physically controlling, um, because it is so loud and the, the sound that it makes is so unpleasant that it's actually meant to cause people to drop, uh, like if they have signs or if they have equipment that is protecting them. Like if they have, you know, like a mask, the idea is that it will be so loud they will want to put their hands over their ears and then they will no longer be able to hold whatever objects they have. So along with your goggles and uh, claws to protect your mouth, uh, giant sound blocking headphones yeah. will be a, a new piece of demonstrator equipment yeah. that we see in the kind of like DIY 
fighting back against the various sort of like tools yeah. of dispersal. Well, and the thing and the thing about it that they say that that is I think very telling is that they're like, "No, it's, you know, the the people who use it, the people who make it. It's like, oh, it's a it's a dispersal device. It's it's nonviolent like or it's not nonviolent. It's um non-lethal or uh, there's a new way that they describe it, less than lethal, I believe is the current way that it is described, a less than lethal device uh that will just encourage people to no longer be in an area, that that is what it is. It is it is dispersal, and that if people are congregating in a way that is deemed unsafe, either to themselves or to others, they this device will be used to encourage them to leave. But what they make no mention of is people who are not able to leave under their own power. You know, like the LRAD is almost always used in conjunction with other pieces of, of crowd crowd management technology, whether it's handcuffs or tear gas or corralling, so that, you know, you you might be able to point this at someone, but if someone is ill, if someone is incapacitated because they have been tear gassed, if someone is handcuffed to something, they will not be able to move. Furthermore, if someone is elderly or in, in a wheelchair or is is injured and is literally not able to move, then then you've you've suddenly gone to a much darker use of a technology that's just used to encourage people to not be somewhere and that this idea of using using sound to encourage people to not be somewhere sort of relies on the the physical ability of those people to not experience that sound which from from the perspective of the people making and selling and using the thing is like oh yeah you just you just leave the area where the sound is it's easy but from the perspective of of the person having that perception, right? Escape escape from noise is is not always an easy thing to do. Right, right. And the, and the real dark side of less than lethal technology is that it gives a kind of free pass. Although certainly the police seem to have no problem using more than lethal technology, but but that less than lethal technology gives you know the state, the police, the military kind of a free pass to engage violently with with people who are are demonstrating right you know. it's almost it's almost a pre-apology it's like oh don't yeah like don't worry about it it's less than lethal like we're just asking you to leave like you know sorry you can't be here but really it's it's just an incredible force right The one other thing I want to talk about, and it's a weird one, is that we are, you know, unintentionally um, engaged in a sound war on the animal population of our world. Is that really? Yes, in a couple of sort of distinct ways. Okay. In in a more general way, there is the fact that uh, anthropogenic sounds, you know, that just all of the sound we make is changing the kinds of sounds that animals make. Uh, there's something called the Lombard effect. It's what happens to us when you go to a party and everyone starts shouting, you know, like it's loud. So every, I mean, it's basically you unintentionally get louder when you're in a loud environment. You also yeah. change your, your pitch a little bit. Uh, and it, it's actually, it's an automatic response. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, apparently it was, it's used to uh, find out when people are pretending to be deaf, pretending to be hard of hearing because they don't do it you know, they don't right. talk louder than they should in a quiet environment because they hear just fine. Anyway, I thought that was... Anyway, so the, the Lombard effect affects people all the time in all kinds of situations. And it's interesting when you're in a situation where you can hear it happen in real time, where like the conversation sort of gets louder and that conversation gets louder and that kind And suddenly you're at kind of the full yeah. volume of a space. And then everybody's been in that situation where suddenly, for whatever reason, all the conversations stop and everybody, everything gets quiet again and then you can hear it build up. I love that. I love that because you're like, what... What Why happened? Right now? What is the like rhythm of this? I'm sure. Anyway, so but this also uh, affects birds, monkeys, whales. So basically, the birds, the city birds we have here, are screaming at each other. Whoa! They I have, have no changed their pitch to be in a different uh, sort of area that is less interfered with 
by uh, anthropogenic sound. That makes that. I mean, it makes perfect sense. They want to communicate clearly with each other, so basically they're shouting in their own sort of bird way, or or at least speaking higher or, or lower. And and in a portion of the sound spectrum that is not already occupied by honking horns or you know like shouting people. Exactly, exactly. So this this affects a, a bunch of different species. Um, and then the most sort of devastating and and sad um, effect of this is on whales and dolphins. They're affect they're uh, affected. By the Lombard effect, they have also changed. They they shout a bit basically when boats are around. Mm-hmm. They also shout more, um, just because it's basically they are trying to get heard. But even more so, sonar, which is still you know the the main communication system of submarines, is like when we were talking about basically you know at what point does sound become a physical damaging force? Uh, for whales and dolphins, the, the answer is whatever frequency sonar is at, whatever strength of sound that is, it is, it both scares the shit out of them. They know that they've done a study and basically they hear it and they all just... They're like, nope, 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 nope. Ex- totally. They stop doing what they're doing. They stop eating. They stop mating. They freak out and wow. they just start swimming. And this this is, they think this is partially what causes them to, to beach themselves. But additionally, uh, for some of them, like beaked whales in particular, which almost never beach themselves normally... And it's a specific kind of beak wheel to curvier beak wheels. Beaked wheel is particularly susceptible to this. Um, they have such sensitive sound instruments in their head. Their heads are built to communicate uh, using sort of hear, listening for sounds from many miles away from other dolphins. And sonar is like a little explosion in their brain it it basically destroys their ability to orient themselves right and so entire huge groups and it's funny because it acts almost as a signal like if a bunch of beaked wheel whales have just um beached themselves there's a pretty good chance there are uh submarine uh, tactics submarine uh you know games or whatever going on yeah in your area yeah um, it's like this sort of weird wow signal flag. Like they're like, and they are they are just actually like like get me out of the water. Like I can't. Is it is like is it a confusion or is it is it is it navigation? Is it escape? Is it? They don't know. They know yeah. for sure. They basically they attached a bunch of recorders to whales and and they know for sure that they freak out when yeah. they hear it. They run away. Yeah. They also believe that they are affected. Certain species basically get something akin to the bends. Yep. Um, in in their brain, they they essentially the the sound causes physical damage, lesions to their brain, which then disorients them. Combined with the fact that it's scary and makes them want to run away, right? They just all you know they will end up essentially, and 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 for all the ones that beach themselves, probably many more uh, are just are very uh, upset or just yeah. can't. Le- I mean, then basically aren't able to survive. Yeah. Because. So um, you know, there's and and to their credit, the Navy has said, yes, we are killing whales and we would like to stop. But, you know, so there's a big push to try and get them to do their exercises in places where there aren't huge, you know, dolphin and whale populations. Yeah. But it's, you know, because of their evolution, they are so much more sensitively attuned to sound that our big, you know, we, we have put them in a world where they kind of can't live with the sheer volume of of sound we're producing. I mean, that's, I think I, I, you know, it's it like, it makes perfect sense. You know, when, when you use sound purposefully as a thing to harm another being, right. The idea is that you are, you are essentially taking control over the entire environment, right? Like you're, you are affecting the being's ecology, right? It's, they cannot, you want to make it so that they like, can't breathe, feel like they can't think, feel like there's, there's no place for them to go that there is not an escape and so it's yeah like it, of course it's just it's such a it, especially at at high volumes and such a pervasive presence that you just you affect the ent- ent- and the entire environment do you ever see that x-files episode where Mulder has like a resonant tone in his head and and like people hear this tone and then they can't stop hearing it until their heads explode no and i he's got it yeah, it's a good one it makes perfect of course yeah it's a little like that all right um uh well thank you for coming by and for talking to me about 
some some fun and interesting things. Also, a couple, you know, some dark stuff. But yeah, for sure. Uh, anything that you want to plug or talk about before we uh, before we wrap up? You can come by Atlas Obscura and and see more interesting things. Not generally sound related, but um, unusual. There's a there's a category for acoustic wonders. Cool. Um, a lot of like whispering rooms and and places where sound does something really strange because of the architecture. Right. Like the um, there's that bench at the. Um, uh, christian science center in boston oh do you guys have that one the you? in in eartha like where the where there's the big um uh not, not eartha sorry uh, the maparium yeah yeah right in the center of the maparium yeah, there's yeah. like a strange yeah and then here in, in uh, grand central there's the archway that, which if you've ever done it yeah it works so well uh there's a name for that it's called creep echo that's an awesome name. Uh, the idea is that as you send sound waves across the archway, they bounce in straight lines across the arch. And, they, and so it's called creep. It just creeps along. It, it reflects in a sort of creeping manner. You also look like a total creep when you're standing with your face in a corner in the middle <laughs> of Grand Central Station. The, uh, other, the other reason it might be called creep echo. Yeah. <laughs> Mortals right, cool. creeps in the corner. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Mike. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me on Twitter and Tumblr at Mike Rugnetta. You can find Dylan and Atlas Obscura on Twitter at Atlas Obscura and also at AtlasObscura.com. You can also find Dylan on another podcast uh, that he co-hosts with a bunch of friends of mine called in which we reveal our ignorance. That one is on iTunes.